Um, so there's a really long title in the program for my paper, and I just shortened this to, I showed my students my truth and they showed me theirs. Um, I would be a liar, a hypocrite, or a fool, and I am not any of those to say that I don't write for the reader. I do. But for the reader who hears, who really will work at it, going behind what I seem to say. So I write for myself and that reader who will pay the dues. Maya Angelou uttered those words during an interview for the Paris Review in January 1988. I was four years old, and many of my students weren't born yet. But the first time I heard those words, I realized the power of writing as activism. As a freshman composition teacher, I use these words as a reminder of my goals to help students find their inner activists through writing. Guiding our students on a path to activism through writing using a black feminist lens starts the moment we create our syllabi for the course. As we sit down to make a course calendar, do we consider our students' needs, our own schedules, or both? Do we consider their potential interests or only what we want to spend the semester reading? Do we plan to solely lecture the material or do we create activities that engage their learning? Are we planning to stand at the forefront as the boss or do we sit down with them as equals? Have we even paid attention to the social issues our student, our student demographic cares about at the moment? How we answer these questions shows not only our own teaching style, but also how likely we are to be successful in motivating our students to care about social justice issues. This presentation focuses on creating student activists by teaching first year writing courses using both black feminist and student led pedagogy through an autobi autobiographical look at my own experience. A student centered classroom requires the teachers to put the needs of their students first. Like bell hooks, I believe this type of student first learning environment is best achieved through the use of a pedagogy founded in feminist ideals. Instructors who follow a feminist pedagogy focus on empowering their students in a way that makes them responsible for their own education. While student-centered learning certainly works at every grade level, it is especially important at the collegiate level, where our goal is to facilitate the growth process of the next generation of thinkers. Starting this growth process in the first year writing course is ideal not only because students oftentimes see this course as a necessary evil, but also because it is usually a student's first experience in a college classroom. First year writing courses are more than prerequisites. They are opportunities to help our students find their voice and learn to use that voice to invoke change on the issues that matter to them most. Along the same vein of student-led pedagogy, Black feminist pedagogy allows any disenfranchised student regardless of race and or ethnicity, an opportunity to have their voice heard. It encourages an awareness of intersectionality between race, gender, sexuality, and social class in a way that many other forms of pedagogy neglect. Even the most privileged, white, heterosexual, able-bodied, upper-class white male student will be able to notice the difference in this classroom <laughs> and that of a teacher-centered one. I've actually got emails from them about that. Simply put, all students benefit from black feminist pedagogy not only because it is student-centered, but it also creates a community, puts the students in charge of their own education by challenging them to discuss and or write about the hard issues and allows their voices to be heard through the use of personal experiences, experiences in writing. As we attempt to facilitate the growth of a new generation of social justice activists, it is important to make sure our voices are heard. heard. Sorry. Black feminist pedagogy encourages this in several ways. Students are exposed to a classroom that opens the door for, crit for crit critics of both the past and present. Gwendolyn Poe, a black feminist theorist, reminds us that when, quote, womanist rhetoric is combined with black feminist pedagogy, the classroom becomes a rhetorical and political space. Issues of difference and the intersections of race, class, and gender inevitably surface, and the classroom is ultimately open to a variety of societal issue issues such as the racism, classism, heterosexism, homophobia, and sexism, to name only a few." End quote. Discussions on these intersections of race, class, and gender continue to be important in a country that is experiencing changes in racial makeup on a daily basis. Black feminist pedagogy allows the instructors to push their students to discuss current events that, while touchy due to the subject matter, are affecting them both inside and outside the classroom. Oftentimes, these current event discussions lead to, discuss to conversations on race from a systematic and institutionalized lens. The first year composition course tends to be diverse and it is only natural that issues of racism will present themselves. 
For many non-minority students, this will be the first time they have discussed race. And it is important to not only be sensitive to this, but to be prepared to serve as a facilitator as students navigate these new feelings and ideas. Beyond topics of race, discussions on sexism and homophobia will often come up. And using a pedagogical practice that challenges students without telling them what to think is ideal. Ad additionally, when practiced correctly, students will feel comfortable challenging the thoughts of their instructor as well. They do. <laughs> Teachers who use Black feminist pedagogy in their classroom challenge their students to move beyond multiple choice answers and into critical thinking. In Talking Back, Thinking Feminist, Thinking Black, Bell Hooks reminds us what a feminist education is designed to do. Quote, Feminist education, the feminist classroom, is and should be a place where there is a sense of struggle, where there is visible acknowledgement of the union of theory and practice, where we work together as teachers and students to overcome the estrangement and alienation that has become so much the norm in the contemporary university. Most importantly, feminist pedagogy should engage students in a learning process that makes the world more rather than less real." End quote. No matter the student's race or gender, they reside in this world and guiding them to engage with important issues through writing helps move them past apathy to empathy and hopefully eventually cause them to action. They will also move beyond simply seeing their teachers as out of touch authority figures. Instead, they are able to view them as humans who care about some of the same things. Black feminist pedagogy levels the who is responsible playing field by allowing the students to have a say in the course goals. Yes, they still have to complete assignments and their teacher grades these assignments, but they have a say in what they write about and how they decide to write about it. I'm sure you're all sitting there wondering when I'm going to explain what this actually looks like in a classroom. Well, in my classroom, it means utilizing consciousness raising during actual lessons. Consciousness raising is a feminist form based upon the ways women have always talked and listened to each other. Quote, the, the consciousness raising format encourages personal sharing, risk taking, and involvement which are essential for getting at how each of us is racist in a daily way, and it encourages the personal change that makes political transformation and action possible." End quote. Additionally, quote, consciousness raising acknowledges that how we feel can inhibit or lead, or lead to action, and that how we actually treat people does make a difference. End quote. It's important to understand that consciousness raising is not merely talk without any follow-up actions. However, the talking makes the action possible. In my classroom, I focus on helping my students understand how their personal interactions with one another can lead to political action in some way. It also means that once again, I need to do this alongside my students. I know I've already mentioned, actually no, I did not, sorry, but I also have to try and create a community as well. Every semester, I start, I start the class with a series of activities that are meant to help them learn more about one another and me. On the first day of class, I have them write a letter introducing themselves to me. They aren't required to share this with anyone else. I read them and write them back, letting them know places we're similar or different. During our second meeting, I have them interview one another and introduce that person to the class. I also encourage them to exchange phone numbers with the classmate at this point, so they have someone to call or text if they miss a class session. Finally, during the start of the third class, I place them in groups and tell them to come up with three things that they all have in common, and then a list of three things, where each thing only applies to one person in the group. Depending on the size of the class, I will sometimes insert myself in a group so that we have even numbers. Once they've done this, they share it with the rest of the class, and as a class, we all try to figure out which thing applies to which person. On the surface, it seems like we're just having fun, but halfway through the activity, the students realize that we're all using stereotypes and prejudice to identify what belongs to each person. It leads to a pretty substantial discussion on the dangers of stereotypes and how this can trickle into our institutions. I make sure to leave time for the students to write about their feelings on how they were stereotyped and we share them at their comfort level. These activities help set the tone for not only their required reading, but starts their wheels turning on their views of the American dream which has been the underlying theme of my comp one class the last two years. Since many of my students follow me to comp two, I typically tweak these activities in some way and then remove the last activity altogether because it doesn't work well for social movements and for the social movements and popular culture theme I've been using lately. The first few times I did these activities, I would pat myself on the back after class for successfully making a potentially 
uncomfortable topic also. I mean, my students are already engaged and it's only week two, so I must be doing this black feminist pedagogy thing right. And then after last year's conference that I wasn't able to attend, two of my former classmates sent me a link to the chair address. They were adamant that I needed to listen to it because it's what I'm always talking about during our conversations on teaching. During last year's chair address, Funk, Flight, and Freedom, Adam Banks told us that the fact that we do discourse and all this messiness gives us the chance to be a hub for intellectual work and for justice work both on campus and off. I nodded as I listened, proud of myself, because hey, I'm doing that all in my classroom. But then Banks started talking about respectability politics and bridged what was transpiring in Ferguson to the very ways we behave as a discipline. I started to squirm while listening, and if I were still a faithful Pentecostal churchgoer, this is when I need to say ouch instead of amen. I said ouch because at the time I've been living a double life of sorts. For all my soapboxes about being authentic with students, I was in fact hiding what was becoming a large part of my written work. Most people, including my students, knew me as a serious graduate student studying Black feminist pedagogy and Hush Harbor rhetoric while trying to bridge them together in a way that is innovative. I kept it real with my students about the difficulties I was facing when it came to preparing for my doctoral exams or figuring out what exactly my dissertation committee wanted from me. I tried to connect with them in regards to popular culture by sharing cute stories about my kids' Kanye West obsession, being pretty close to my Beyonce one. I showed them the difficulties of escaping popular culture and that even free thinkers fall victim to the gravitational pull of American media, but that we could find a way to incorporate it into our writing. I used the latest popular culture phenomenon to teach rhetorical analysis. We listened to McLemore's thrift shop and discussed the controversy around him winning best rap album at the Grammys over Kendrick Lamar. We even used the Hunger Games to predict our post-apocalyptic futures. These were definitely all conversations that I was having both inside and outside the classroom. But while I was asking my students to be true to themselves and develop an authentic voice when writing, I wasn't doing the same. Sure, I sat in a circle with them and guided them through difficult conversations on privilege and the American dream, sharing my own realizations when I was their age and how they've evolved over the years. However, I was still hiding an entire part of my life from them. See, four years ago, while pregnant with my son, I started a blog, a mommy blog, to be specific. For the first year or so, I used the pen name to shield myself from the possible disdain of colleagues and potential employers. Eventually, I used my first name, but was careful not to include my last name. My blog, Momademics, was a space for me to not only talk about my kid, but also to work through the ways parenting and the academy were intersecting for me. At the start of the 2014 fall semester, I've written my first and only viral post about the parenting implications of white moms ignoring the deaths of murdered black children. This was shortly after the death of Michael Brown. I posted the blog out of frustration never thinking it would get much traction, but it did. In 24 hours, it was viewed more than 15,000 times and soon my colleagues were sharing it. While they were commending the post, I was nervous because this was the first time my two lives were converging in the public sphere. When school started that semester, I did mention my blog post to my students initially. We talked about Ferguson some and they even wrote about it during in-class writing sessions. I can't remember what triggered me telling them about the blog post. Maybe someone asked me how I really felt about it and my guard was down, but I told them. They were interested in the post, but they were really interested in my blog. They asked questions and I felt squeamish about it. I think I asked them to wait until the semester was over to follow my updates there. Not because I talked about them, but because all of a sudden the idea of my students coming across the mundane parenting things I don't manipulate for classroom discussions was terrifying. The two identities I tried so hard to keep separate were merging, and I was losing control of how not only my students saw me, but also my colleagues. As with most things in popular culture and on social media, the talk about my post died down, and I was left wondering what next. In the blog world, I started working on a series entitled Raising an Advocate as an answer to the how do we fix it question I frequently received in my inbox. Conversations with my students about Black Lives Matter in Ferguson and working on that series actually inspired the social movements and popular culture theme I used in Comp 2 for the first time in spring 2015. And this course, students chose a social movement, choose a social movement that interests them, and after doing research on the movement, they start analyzing the popular culture of it, of that movement. 
And finally, they formulate a research argu argument on whether or not popular culture has hindered, helped, or in the case of the older movement, changed the view of, their, of the movement. By the time I heard last year's chair address, chair's address, we only had a month left of school. My students were in presentation and final essay writing mode, so I filed it away for later. During the break, I kept critiquing my own commitment to Black feminist pedagogy in relation to social justice. Banks' reminder that respectability would not save us in the academy played in my head as the streets of Baltimore erupted in riots after the death of Freddie Gray. I watched silently as people shamed Baltimore citizens, and then I put my fingers on the keys and I wrote a blog post entitled, I used to be a respectable Negro, but then I woke up. <laughs> this post, this piece didn't go viral, but it ignited a fire inside me. I submitted it for a blog award competition, and by the time the next fall semester rolled around, I was ready. Well, as ready as I was going to be, but like Banks told us all last year, being willing to really fly on and reach for the stars means that we drop some of our worries about what's happening right now and fix our gaze on big challenges and problems and then work backward. I started that semester just like the others, but this time I shared my website pretty much right away. No one asked me, I just showed my students this entire other type of writing I was doing and how this would look in an academic setting. I showed them how I weaved in quotations by bell hooks and other scholars, all while telling a short story that invoked emotion and conversation. I can't say for sure if them seeing my less academic writing caused this change, but for the first time, the majority of my students were using I without me reminding them it was okay. The narratives they wrote were some of the best I've seen in my almost eight years of teaching. As the semester progressed, I often arrived to class a bit early so we could just chat about life before class started. When my respectable Negro post won an award, I shared the video of me reading it with them, even though it showed me being vulnerable and crying in front of a room of people. As they moved into analyzing their own privilege or lack thereof and how it shaped their view of the American dream, I saw them responding empathetically to one another's, another's work. I started receiving less, tell me exactly how to write this, emails, and could see the confidence growing as they developed their own voice while critiquing both their personal life and society. Around the same time, I received an email from a student who took both comp one and two with me during the previous semester, when I first admitted the blog exists, quote, you and your classes last year have really helped me to find a clear vision of my role in this world. You have really inspired me academically and given me the courage and or permission to explore the roots of social injustice in order to make a positive lasting contribution. I'm also grateful because instead of reading stories and poetry, you allowed us to explore ourselves and the world around us. All of this coupled with your honesty about your truth are what make you an effective educator. I watched the video of you reading your award-winning blog entry. I read it when it was written and it moved me then, but seeing the words come from your mouth was powerful. Congratulations, you deserve it. If you ever doubt yourself, remember that you continue to make an impact on your students whether you see the effects or not. The way you navigate academia and motherhood is truly an inspiration, although it can be frustrating to blaze trails. In the end, you paved the way for others to have the courage to endure. I am eternally grateful for you and your class. End quote. Those words from a student who learned from me as I transitioned into a new phase as an instructor let me know I'd done the right thing when I told them about my blog, even though it terrified me. Sure, it was only one student's response to my methods, but that's one more social justice activist among us, one more person ready to change the world, and I'm okay with it.